Good morning. I'm not sure if this might. Oh, it is working. Wonderful. If you could all find a seat, we'll begin the uh, program here in a moment. My name is Jerry Taylor. I'm the president and co-founder of the Niskanen Center. I'd like to welcome you to our conference this morning, Beyond Left and Right, Reviving Moderation in an Era of Crisis and Extremism. I'd like to take a special uh, 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 thanks for the uh, support that we've received to promote this conference and to uh, uh, put it forward uh, uh, for you this morning uh, with the gracious help of the Hewlett Foundation and Daniel Stid, who is our grand officer there, is in the front, in, uh, the, front of the room. So uh, thank you for Hewlett or else uh, this conference would not have been able to exist. I'm sure it strikes many of you as uh, a bit disconcordant that during a time of uh, rampaging hyperpartisanship and increasing ideological extremism that we would have a conference about reviving moderation. Uh, it doesn't seem a precipitous time for it. Uh, and there is a widespread perception that conversations like these may have been appropriate for certain times in American history, but they're not appropriate for this particular time. Uh, I find that not particularly persuasive. If we look at history, uh, we find that uh, on a number of occasions when America's center was breaking apart and when hyperpartisanship and division was at its greatest, we find that that's when moderation has historically stepped into the breach and righted the ship. Of course, in 1860, we saw that with Abraham Lincoln. Not many people today think of him as a moderate, but for those who follow history and the career of Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know that he was a moderate in his day. The abolitionists looked at him with great skepticism, as did the slave power. He tried his, uh, he tried his uh, level best to navigate those uh, treacherous waters and to keep the Union together and the country from falling apart. Uh, and so he ran, and his, he ran as and attempted to govern as a moderate. Of course, it fell apart. But like all good moderates, at times when uh, compromises have been played out and uh, opportunities have uh, run dry, that uh, they rallied to the breach to the important causes of the day, which Abraham Lincoln did. But it was an example of moderation uh, arising in a time when we might least expect it. About 100 years later, we saw it again with the arrival of Dwight Eisenhower on the political scene. People forget today how, how rancid American politics was at that time, how extremism and hyperpartisanship had been uh, rolling through the political landscape. It was with the election of Dwight Eisenhower when uh, Joseph McCarthy was at his peak of political power. Uh, if one wants an antecedent to Donald Trump, one would work hard to try to find somebody uh, more appropriate than, say, George Wallace or 
or uh, Joseph McCarthy, uh, of a failed and unpopular war in Korea. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower then brought, uh, walked into the breach, righted the ship, and took control of a Republican Party that was every bit as toxic and dangerous in some ways as uh, many of us uh, fear the Republican Party is today, and rewrited the ship. So there is a long history of moderation arising in the least expected times and places uh, and coming to the rescue in American politics. And it's that prospect that compelled us to have this conversation today. But of course, moderation has a very poor reputation in American politics. Jim Hightower once famously said that the only thing found in the middle of the yellow stripes and dead armadillos. Uh, when you're in Washington and you talk about moderation, generally people interpret you as talking about milk, co milk toast deal cutters who stand for very little except getting reelected and, and offending the least number of people possible. Uh, that's how the uh, political cognizante think of moderation. Uh, and if you look at the two parties today, you find that moderates have not fared very well. While moderates are once a vibrant part of the Republican Party, they've all been uh, all but been drummed out of the GOP. Moderates are on their heels with all of the energy being held by the progressive left. Um, yet, for all of that, the two most popular governors in America today, by far, going in a way, are two moderates: Charlie Baker of Massachusetts and Larry Hogan of Maryland. Uh, by far and away, they are more popular than left or right governors as we might conventionally think of them in America today. A plurality of voters in the United States identify themselves, self-identify as moderate, and some of the most successful politicians in our adult lives have, have arrived at their political success through an embrace of moderation. And here I'm thinking of Bill Clinton, uh, Tony Blair, who will be speaking later on today, and even Barack Obama, who govern quite moderately, at least relative to where the Democratic Party is today. Uh, so moderation, while it has a poor reputation in American politics, I think, uh, unfortunately, is uh, uh, that, that perception is mistaken. and It's stronger than we might think. Moderation also has a poor reputation intellectually uh, in the public intellectual class. Of course, moral clarity powerfully argued is the coin of the realm, something that moderates are a bit leery of engaging in. And yet for all of that, some of the most impressive and important public intellectuals of the 20th century uh, have embraced the cause of moderation as we might understand it today. And by that I mean people like Raymond Aaron, Isaiah Berlin, Albert Camus, uh, Jose Ortega y Gasset, Michael Oakeshott, Karl Popper. None of these are intellectual lightweights, all of whom more or less find themselves in the same world that the Niskanen Center finds itself in. But be that as it may, uh, moderation tends to be out of fashion today. Uh, yet we all sense a growing dread in America today that what we lack is exactly this. Uh, even ideologues who are married to the left or the right or those more principled politicians, I think, have a sense of dread that the center is falling apart. We are increasingly at each other's throats and the lubricant of toleration, pluralism and moderation, which allows for the engine of government and public policy to go forward, is uh, increasingly in danger. And without that sort of sense of moderation, that uh, we have much more dangerous times in front of us. It's altogether fitting then that our welcoming address would come from someone like David Brooks. David is an author and columnist who has become one of the most influential public intellectuals of our time. While in college, he was offered a job by William F. Buckley, no moderate, uh, which led him to begin working for the National Review. He subsequently became a prominent commentator at many other publications and media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, uh, NPR, and PBS NewsHour. Since 2003, he has become a columnist for the New York Times, where he has drawn the wrath of liberals and conservatives alike. His columns have increasingly moved from away from politics, social science, and neuroscience towards broad themes of faith and morality. In 2017, he said that, quote, one of my callings is to represent a certain moderate Republican Whig political philosophy, and the other is to try to shift the conversation more in a moral and theological direction. Uh, both of these conversations, I think, are critically important today, and so it is my delight to have David Brooks off our conference today. David?
Thank you, Jerry. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be with Niskanen. Um, in a very short period of time, Niskanen has become one of our most creative intellectual centers. Uh, it's like when you show, throw off the shackles of ideology, suddenly there's a birth of creativity and idea and vitality, and Niskanen uh, has been that. Uh, now, I confess, I consider myself a moderate today. I haven't always been a moderate. I grew up in Greenwich Village in the 1960s, and I was a man of the left, a child of the left. Uh, when I was in second grade, I wrote on the chalkboard that Julie Nixon was a Nazi. Uh, I'm not sure why I thought she was a Nazi, but I was fighting the man, the establishment, uh, and I got paddled for it. So I've, I've paid my price uh, for being a, a radical. Uh, and then in 1965, um, well, earlier actually, when I was four years old, my parents took me to a B in in Central Park where hippies would go just to be. Uh, and one of the things the hippies did was they set a garbage can on fire and threw their wallets into it to demonstrate their liberation from money and material things. And I was four and I saw a $5 bill on fire in the garbage can, so I broke from the crowd, reached into the fire, grabbed the money and ran away. Um, that was sort of my first step over to the right. Um, and so I like to think even then I was flexible. I was ideologically flexible. Um, and then uh, when I was 17, um, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago, um, uh, which is a school, of the best thing about Chicago, it's a, a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. So, um, and there, uh, even though it has a reputation of being a conservative school, uh, I was super left. Uh, in those days, I wrote a parody of William F. Buckley for being a name-dropping blowhard. Um, and he um, came to campus and he gave a speech and the, the parody was like in college Buckley formed two magazines, one called the National Buckley and one called the Buckley Review, which he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. Uh, and so it was like that spirit. And at the end of his speech, um, he said, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, I want to give you a job. And that was the big break of my career, actually. Uh, sadly, I wasn't in the audience. Um, I was actually that week out in California debating Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman did a show called Tyranny of the Status Quo on PBS, where it was Milton Talks to the Young. And I'm a democratic socialist, and I would regurgitate some point I'd read somewhere, and he would destroy it in about six words. And then the show is mostly the camera lingering on my face while I try to think of something to say. And you can actually go on YouTube today and find a 22-year-old David Brooks being utterly flummoxed and embarrassed by Milton Friedman. Uh, and so that, I, he was, I never became a Milton Friedman conservative, but I gradually moved over to the right. Chicago forced me to read Edmund Burke. Um, I became an admirer of, of Alexander Hamilton, who's a Latino hip hop star from the Bronx or from the Heights. Um, and I became a Whig. Uh, and it took me a little while. We all have to try on different pieces of clothing before we find out where we are. But I'm basically a Whig, uh, and, uh, or a rhino, as we say. And I've, I'm one of those people, uh, one of many probably in this room, um, who could never vote for Trump uh, on racial grounds alone, frankly, uh, and on moral grounds. And so I assumed that in 2020 I would vote for the Democrats. And I realized it would take a lot of work for the Democrats to turn away my vote. They're doing that work very exceptionally well. <laughs> uh, and so I probably could never uh, vote for any candidate who supported the Green New Deal. Uh, you know, I lived through the 20th century, I know what central planning does, uh, and I don't think we really need to learn those lessons again. Richard Weaver had a, a saying, the problem with the next generation is they haven't read the minutes to the last meeting. Uh, and so if we're going to have to relearn the lessons of central planning again, uh, I really don't want to learn them. Uh, so I'm homeless, I'm politically homeless, and when Niskanen came out with a lot of the, Will Wilkerson, a lot of the, the reports they've come out with with Brink, uh, suddenly I, I've read them and I thought, yeah, that's a home. There are a lot of people who come from different directions but have come to the same place. And a lot of people in this room uh, are in that same place. The crucial thing is moderates can't just be against, just can't be against left and right. Um, I've sort of been impressed by the movement No Labels, but I've always thought that you can't be, start a movement whose first word is no. You have to be for something. And so you want a vision. And so the question is, what is the passionate ideal that moderates are for? Frankly, Isaiah Berlin, Raymond Aron, and others, not good enough. 
we're not going to start a movement whose primary motivating engine for the masses is Oakshot. There has to be an animating idea. Successful political and cultural moments have a radioactive thought. Now in 1999, uh, Andrew Del Banco wrote a book called The Real American Dream. And he divided American history according to the, the big radioactive thoughts that govern the different stages. The first era, the radioactive thought was God. The Puritans came here, saw the plentiful nature of this continent, and decided God's plan for humanity could be completed on Earth, and that we could get really rich in the process. And so they were striving to realize God's plan for humanity. Virginia and Massachusetts were conceived in a bed of religion. Jonathan Edwards said that this is a place for the new and most glorious state of the church. Cotton Mather gave a famous serving, sermon called God's City America. Jonathan Winthrop talked about the sacred of the shining city on a hill. And he didn't mean that in a good way, by the way. When Reagan twisted it, he twisted it around as something good. When Winthrop first uttered the statement, he said, we are the shining city on the hill. God's plans for humanity rest on us, and we're screwing it up. It was a Jeremiah. And America was built, as the historian Zach Van Berkovich said, on the nature of our Jeremiah's on we're failing God. And that was the animating principle early on, and it lasted through the revolution. John Adams said, I always considered the settlement of America with reverence and wonder as the opening of a grand scene in design and providence for the illumination of the ignorant and the emancipation of the slavish parts of the earth. We were the universal nation that was going to liberate the earth. And that created a lot of anxiety. The second animating idea, which followed probably around 1830, was nation. The period of Western settlement was a period of adolescent pride, America becoming aware of itself, and the height of American exceptionalism. Webster wrote his dictionary knowing that even though there were only 30, 3 million Americans when he wrote it, there would be 40 million soon. They completely anticipated that America would be the superpower of the earth. Tocqueville found an irritable patriotism because Americans were so given to the idea of nation. The pioneer experience was an experience of radical hopeness, hopefulness of future orientation. They passed by perfectly good farmland in Kentucky because they were convinced something better was on the other side. And they just kept going west. There's a great book called Giants of the Earth, which I think is set in the Dakotas. And there's a farmer leading around a guy to his farm. And he says, well, this is where my crops are. This is where my barn is. This is where my house is. And the visitor says, well, I don't see any of that. And he said, well, I haven't built it yet. It's in the future. And that, in, in the essence, was the spirit of that sense of national destiny. Melville described it in White Jacket, his novel. We Americans are the particular chosen people, the Israel of our time. We bear the mark of liberties of the world. God has predestined mankind, expects great things from our race, and great things we feel in our souls. And so this sort of fervent nationalism fueled America through the 19th century up to TR and maybe through World War II and that sense of American exceptional, the unique destiny of America. That phase, animated by nation, ended, Del Banco says, around the late 50s, early 60s. And a new ideal animated America, and that was the ideal of self, self. Uh, it was um, the problem with the nation period was that it was a guest house nation. If you were a white Protestant, it was your house. If you were not, you were just a guest. And you could be accepted in American society if you played by the Protestant rules, but if you didn't, you were excised. And so that was going to be unacceptable to people. And then in the 1950s, people felt conformity, conformity crushing them. Service to community, service to nation felt like a crushing conformity. And so there were all these books, The Organization Man, The Man on the Gray Flannel Suit. People wanted to break out. And in 1962, you really see the shift. A bunch of radicals got together in Port Huron, Michigan, and put together the Port Huron Statement, was a state, which was a statement of individualism. We want to be free to be ourselves. Betty Friedan wrote her book. The hippies came out, the self-esteem movement. It was about the liberation of self, the emancipation of self. And that, too, is a radioactive, powerful ideal. It was symbolized in my childhood by one of the great events of my childhood, which was Super Bowl III. 
Uh, in Super Bowl III, two quarterbacks faced off against each other, and one was an organization man for the Baltimore Colts, a guy named Johnny Unitas. Crew cut, uh, very boring, high top sneakers, classic 1950s guy. The guy on the other side of the field grew up just miles away from Johnny Unitas in western Pennsylvania, but 10 years apart. And that was Joe Namath. Namath had long hair, $5,000 fur coats. He was a swinger. He was anti-institutional. He wrote a memoir called, I Can't Wait Until Tomorrow Because I Get Better Looking Every Day. <laughs> and Johnny Unitas would not have read it in that memoir. And so that symbolized the shift in culture away from organization and to self. Suddenly it was cool to be young, not old, expressive, not reticent, casual, not formal, rebel, not a conformist, individual, not institutional. It was all about liberation. Liberated by education from the bonds of religion, liberated by democracy from the bonds of class, liberated by culture from restrictions on sex and free expression, liberated by technology from poverty, liberated by the ballot box from government. And the era of self had a left-wing version, which was about social and lifestyle liberation, and it had a right-wing version, which was about economic liberation, uh, the Reagan agenda. And it produced a lot of good things. We have a much more creative economy, creative culture, because we've been individually liberated. But everything turns bad when you take it to the extreme, and we've pretty much run out the string on 60 years of hyper-individualism. We've divided the nation one from another and we've divided the links from another. 35% of Americans over 45 are chronically lonely. More than 50% of Americans say that no one knows them well. Only 8% of Americans report having important conversations with their neighbors. The fastest growing political party is unaffiliated. The fastest growing religious movement is unaffiliated. Since 1990, the suicide rate is up 30%. Among teenagers between 7 and 17, the suicide rate is up 70%. And suicide is a proxy for loneliness. Life expectancy in America is declining, not rising. Uh, we have the deaths of despair. We have an era of tremendous distrust. If you ask people a generation ago, do you trust the institutions of your society, 75 and 80% said yes. Now it's down to 22%. If you asked people a generation ago, do you trust your neighbors, are the people around you basically trustworthy? You had about 60% said, yeah, they're basically trustworthy. Now it's 32% say they can trust their neighbors and 18% of millennials. The younger you get, the more distrust there is. And so we've had a period of weakening institutions, weakening bonds, drifting us apart. Institutions are not something that shape us. They're something, as Yuval Levin says, that we perform upon. And so we have sort of taken self to the extreme. And so in my view, we've, ri we've run out of self. We've run out the string on the radioactivity of that idea, and people are looking for something new. And so what you get, there's a, a social theorist whose name I'm forgetting, but she says that um, culture moves forwards in this, what she calls the ratchet, hatchet, pivot, ratchet phase. There's a problem. Society creates a collective response to it, and a new radioactive idea takes hold, and it ratchets up. It lasts for a while, and then it stops working and people have to hatchet it up. They have to chop up the culture. And then they pivot over because people are ingenious. They find another response and then you get another ratchet. It's basically a version of paradigm shift from Kuhn. That paradigms work for a while, they stop working, and then you get a period of paradigm competition as people try to replace the old paradigm. And to me, Donald Trump just destroyed the old paradigm. He destroyed the Reagan Republican Party. He destroyed the paradigm that was frankly outdated. I liken him to Abby Hoffman. Abby Hoffman was not a great political genius, but he was good at political theory and exposing the, f the weaknesses of the old system. And Donald Trump is our Abby Hoffman. So now we have other people presenting radioactive ideas to us. And the first is Donald Trump. He wants to replace the idea of self with the idea of tribe. That we need more ethnic cohesion, we need to return to an era of fervent patriotism and cohesion around our ethnic identity, our white ethnic identity. We, we need to go back to a white America that frankly is never coming back. Now tribe seems like patriotism, it seems like a return to nation, but it's not. 
That old nationalism was based on the idea we're a universal nation. We're the home of all mankind. We're the last best hope of Earth. Trump's tribalism is not based on that idea. It's a European-style nationalism. It's a tribal mentality based not on abundance mentality, but on a scarcity mentality. It's not based on mutual affection. It's based on mutual hatred for the other. It's always friend-enemy distinctions, us-them, zero-sum mindset, the outsiders threaten us, life is conflict, politics is war, ideas are comfort, uh, combat, mistrust is the worldview, erect walls, build barriers. And tribe is a very radioactive idea. It always has been, and it always will be, and it's motivating a lot of people. And so that's a very powerful ideal to go up against. Now the left has another idea. Uh, and their idea is social justice. Um, the left sees division in society, they tell a story of oppression. The structure of life is oppressor oppressed. The story of American history is the economy is about oppressor oppressed, there's class oppression. The story of relations between the races is oppressor oppressed, there's racial oppression. The relationship between the genders is a story of oppression, there's sexist oppression. And that is, that's, a, that's a very meaningful idea to people. Jonathan Haidt once wrote, a funny thing happens when you take human beings whose minds evolve for tribal warfare and us them thinking, and you fill those minds with binary dimensions. You tell them that one side of the binary is good and the other is bad. You turn on their ancient tribal circuits, preparing them for battle. Many students find this thrilling. It fills them with a sense of meaning and purpose. And the oppressor oppressed social justice narrative fills a lot of people with a sense of meaning and purpose. And of course, like tribalism, it's based on a lot of truth. And, and so you see the rise of that. Uh, and, the, and the response, like with all stories of oppression, is how do you get the weak strong? You take over the state. You centralize power of the state and ally it with the proletariat. And so that's where the left uh, is going. Now, the two current ideas that are out there, tribalism and social justice, are not particularly attractive to me. They're not attractive because they're both based on conflict and war. That life is a series of conflicts, one side, one the other. They both have an authoritarian strain, that it's about concentrating power in the state. They both are based on a scarcity mindset. Both of them are based on the idea that conflict is the central dynamic in human affairs. Both of the, them are based on the central fantasy of our time, which is that the other half of the nation can be conquered and it will disappear. It's based on the fantasy that you can somehow magically get 70% of the United States Senate and govern forever and do everything you want. And that will never happen. And so these are visions that first lead to conflict and second are politically unrealistic. We live in a closely divided country, we need other people. And so moderates have to come up with an animating idea, an idea that people can legitimately devote their lives to that is an, al just, an alternative to tribalism and social justice. What is that idea? Well, look at the problems we face. To me, the core problem America faces is the problem of division. The problem of division, fragmentation, crisis of connection, alienation, and distrust. We have a widening economic divide between the rich and poor, we have a widening cultural divide between the educated and less educated, a widening divide between rural and urban, between black and white, native and immigrant, between left and right. And so the big questions of our time is, how do you maintain cohesion as we become majority minority? How can you increase social mobility in the face of technological change? How can you bind our political system so it can deal with the big challenges like global warming? How can you strengthen families and communities and social capital at a time when everything is falling apart? These are just the big challenges. And to me, the right response and the big animating idea is found in Leviticus and Matthew. It's the second commandment, love your neighbor. The left and the right are, are ideologies of anger and political war. But the right response to that is fraternity, solidarity, affection, and relationship. Love your neighbor is a cause that people throughout centuries have given their lives to. It's a vision of what Josiah Royce called the beloved community. 
where we actually reach across and try to greet each other with understanding, and if you want to be mushy about it, love. We're in the most avo emotionally avoidant city on the face of the earth, <laughs> but you somehow have to talk that way. And so to me, human society is bound by our common love for each other as fellow Americans, and love and, and fellowship is the ultimate moderate emotion. And it suggests an agenda. There are four affections that hold our society together. And it seems to me the job for moderates is to build those affections. The first affection we all, that bind us together, is our love for our kids. Not just our biological kids, but the kids around us. This is a great binding force in any community across difference. So the first goal for a moderate movement is to make sure kids grow up in a web of loving relationships. Government can help. Nurse family partnerships, child tax credits, early childhood education, parental leave, schools that nurture relationship through social and emotional learning. The second great affection is our calling for the work of our hands. Our work is what binds us to society. It gives us a social role. It gives us something to do, a way to feel connected to others in service. So moderates can use government to help people develop their ties to their vocation and to the people they work with. Apprenticeship tracks, increasing the earned income tax credit, wage subsidies, moving subsidies, or in Cass's idea of work councils, which are like health clubs to give you training and representation through your job. Reshape capitalism so it's not just about maximizing shareholder value, but about serving community. A third affection is to our place. We love our towns. I go around the country for this, I'm involved in this thing at the Aspen Institute called Weave, the Social Fabric Project. And we go around meeting community builders all around the country and I always ask this question, what layer of society are you most attached to? Is it your block, your neighborhood, your town, your county, your state, your country, or all of humanity? About 5% say all of humanity. 90% say my town. I personally feel most attached to the nation, but I'm in a minority. They really feel attached to their town. They trust their town. They would lay down their life for their town. And so we need to nourish the affection for place. And the way you do that, partly through a national service program where we pay people to serve their community in any way they saw fit, but partly you have to devolve power down to the local community. The community is a group of people with a common story. A community is a group of people with a common project. So if we devolve power away from Washington to local government, you get people actively building community with each other. And so a, a process of radical decentralization is the third of the affections and the third item of the agenda. The fourth affection is just our nation and our relationships to our kind. I was in the Metropolitan Museum with, with a friend of mine whose family came over here in the 16th century who is related to George Washington. And we were looking at a portrait of Washington and he innocently asked me, What's it like for you? Like, I am actually related to him. He really is the father of my country. But you have no relation to George Washington. Well, what's, what's it like for you to look at him? I was like, that thought never occurred to me. <laughs> of course he's the father of my nation. And so we just feel a natural affinity to being part of this nation. And the, to, the division of that is a division of race. We used to talk when I was growing up of racial integration. That was the core idea, frankly, for American progressives. We don't talk about integration anymore. Republicans don't talk about it because it's part of more tribal. Democrats don't talk about it because in multicultural ethos, racial integration is, can be hegemonic. And so as a result, American schools are more segregated than the 1970s. Neighborhoods are more segregated than the 1970s. Workplaces are more segregated than the 1970s. Wealth is more segregated. Racism is the core sin of the country. Any movement has to put racial integration foremost as a process of social integration. Basically, we need to tell a story. Moderation is not an ideology. It's a way of being. It's a way of talking to other people and from them you see how different we all are from each other. Moderation is humility of the mind, but ardor of the heart. When you talk to people, actually converse with people unlike yourself, you realize that 
politics is a competition between partial truths. And you're just trying to find the right balance. There's no one ideology, as Jerry has written, that solves all our problems. You see that creativity is syncretistic. It calls from pulling items from here and from there. You see the danger of reducing yourself to a single identity and the fanaticism that arises out of that. These are all epistemological humility that come about when you talk to people and respect and love people across difference. You see that politics is a limited activity. There's a great Samuel Johnson couplet, of all the things that human hearts endure, how few are those that kings can cause and cure. The things that really matter to us are relationships to each other and our character. Politics is important, but it's not that important. And so you get, don't get so hyped up about it. You don't look for, to base your identity on politics. That's asking of politics more than politics can deliver. It's idolizing politics. And so it's, that's all epistemological humility. But at the core of moderation is our love for one another and our love to see connection in each other, to go down to the deepest level of each other, reach across our divides, and actually connect on some intimate level the sort of relationship that actually produces joy. Now, it's hard in this country to talk about a politics of love. It seems like the politics of meaning, remember that? But it is in a divided country, in a fragmented country, in an angry culture, country, it seems like that's the most emotion, proper emotional prosper uh, uh, position, posture, to the vocations we love, to the creeds we love, to the country we love, to each other. And that act of reaching out and seeking solidarity and friendship and relationship is the ultimate moderate cause. Thank you. What a brilliant talk. Uh, the idea of uh, cultivating love and affection certainly suggests that for moderates, we need to blow up our Twitter accounts. <laughs> or at least I have to blow up mine. Uh, we have time for one and only one question before we move to our next panel, which will allow us to talk in more granularity about why the center seems to be fraying and, uh, uh, and uh, failing to hold. But, we have a question for David, uh, I will go to Emil. Uh, unlike you, I've been a, oh, thanks. Unlike you, I became a moderate Republican when I was 12 years old out of admiration for Dwight Eisenhower and people in this room who know me will say, I haven't moved, the world has changed, but I haven't. And, you know, I believe fervently in what you say, and yet the moment doesn't seem quite right if I can put it that way, to love thy neighbor as the animating idea. This seems to be a moment right now when you have to choose sides and fight, because I think there is a fundamental threat to everything that we believe in in terms of basic American democratic values. I think this is a moment, it may pass, but for now I think we have to choose sides and fight, which is not the idea of moderation that you articulate and that which in, in which I want to believe. And I'd be curious about your reaction to that. Yeah, I, I, you know, what we do shapes who we are. And if we decide the idea is to fight, then we become fighters. And to me, when you become a fighter, you know, in, I was with the Wall Street Journal uh, in the 90s, and I covered a lot of great events. And I covered the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Mandela coming out of prison in South Africa, the Oslo peace process. It was all about falling barriers and people coming together. I covered one event at the end, which I barely paid attention to, the Yugoslav Civil War. And in retrospect, that was the most important event of that era because it led to the succession of ethnic identity, authoritarianism, and tribalism that we've seen since. And that's, that trend is not just a move, it's a spiral. As each side responds to the horror of the other, and each side degrades themselves in that process. And the only way you get out of that spiral is by somebody making a brave stand and saying, no, that's not who I am. And that's frankly the lesson of Martin Luther King. 
It was very possible to argue, as people before and after King did, no, we need to fight. And he said, no, you answer hatred with love. Uh, and he says, if you just keep on loving on people. They'll hate you for a little while, but eventually they'll break under the power of your love. And he did that partly as a strategy for social change, partly to appeal to the better angels of people's nature, but partly out of awareness of his own sinfulness. And that once you adopt an attitude of hatred and opposition, then you destroy a little piece of yourself. And if you do that, you've, under, you've undermined anything that can lead to a political solution. So to me, it, the answer is actually the opposite of not falling into the logic of hate versus hate but breaking out of that spiral and breaking out of that logic with a different language. And that is sort of what I think the country is ready for. Thank you very much. I'm all under the guidance of my colleague, Jeff Caberservice. I've been reading a lot of Lincoln lately, who I think is really the founding father of this country, at least this modern nation that we have. And one of the things that's most striking is the rhetoric of love from Abraham Lincoln, even in the midst of the bloodiest civil war uh, uh, up to that point in global history. Uh, the carnage that followed was tremendous, but all during it, it Prior to the war and in the conduct of the war and as it was winding down, it was a constant admonition from Lincoln with regards to the fact that these are our brothers and that we must love and that this horrible war needs to, needs to be resolved and it needs to be resolved not with fury and with vengeance but with love and, re and uh, reconciliation. Tremendously powerful. And of course, the contemporaneous version might be looking at Nelson Mandela in South Africa who wove together a nation out of the least fertile fields of uh, affection and love and yet was a tremendous uh, uh, vehicle for exactly that in a place which is most surprising that we, that we would be very surprised to see. It seems, in, it seems constantly interesting to me that during the worst periods of division and rancor and hatred and suspicion that constantly those situations have given birth to exactly the kind of moderation and politics of love that David Brooks so eloquently offered here today. But we'll move on and with a bit more granularity. My colleague Brink Lindsay now will convene a panel to discuss exactly why it is the center is not holding and uh, we'll get into a wonderful conversation on that front to help inform the rest of our conversations today. So thank you and Brink, why don't you and the rest of the speakers come up?